Without further ado, can I please welcome CEO of Hotel Chocolat, Angus Thurwell. Thanks, Rory. Thanks Good ever so much here. for coming along uh, today. And I'm sure you know, they've had heard enough of me. They want to hear more about uh, what's going on from a business perspective. Um, so yes, we, I mentioned we went to school together. And if you think back to our time, we're at Barney Castle School up in the north of England. Um, I mean, I, I had a very clear idea in my mind when I was at school that I wanted to join the Air Force. I remember going to CCF. I think we're in the, uh, we're in the Air, Air Force section as well. That's right, yeah. So you knew I wanted to join the Air Force and various things. Um, but if I reflect back, and that's quite obvious because of what I was doing and various things, and I was going and doing um, tests and all the stuff, but if I think back to your time going through to O-levels and then sixth form, I can't actually think, did you actually think we're going down this, this road? What was going through your mind at the time about what you were planning to do when you left? I think your father had a business, I don't know. Yeah, I, I um, grew up in a kind of entrepreneurial family, so I'd, I'd seen uh, with my dad that business could be really exciting. You know, he came home, you know, always quite energized and it seemed like business was you know, glamorous and exciting, you know, a bit of daring do was going on. Um, and the school, Barnard Castle, was um, remarkably laissez-faire in a lot of respects. So you could pretty much do what you wanted um, in, 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 in a few areas. So. Um, the underlying structure, it was a very good school, so we had a very good education, particularly good at sport, and we had some total superstars. Um, but the thing that really piqued my interest was um, taking over this thing called the Film Society from some older boys who were leaving, and they just gave me sort of like, you know, five-minute training on it. <laughs> like, here's, this is where we've got an account of this film rental company in Wardour Street. You can, you can hire films, they get delivered um, by, by courier, and we've got permission from the chemistry lab to use their projector. So over to you, there you go, Film Society, take it over. So I, I looked at the catalogue of stuff that this film outfit had, and there were some really great films, and um, it, it appeared to be kind of basic subscription model as well. So kids would, would uh, say, right, I'm in, here's my pound for the term, and I, I understand I'm going to get you know, two or three films to watch. The opportunity really came to amp up the advertising. So we, could, we you know, did our own posters and fly posted them around the school when we had a particularly juicy film coming up. And pushing the boundaries a bit, we had Straw Dogs with Susan George. And I might have started a rumour that she, you know, took her top off. <laughs> so can't believe um, young young boys would be interested yeah. in that at all. So basically, yeah. it was a huge uptick in subscriptions. But then the other thing was taking money on the door, which was more expensive than the subscriptions, but the convenience of you know just getting instant access. So we we literally had this thing going, and uh, we were making you know, a lot of a lot of cash, and we had to start laundering the cash. Um, by going down to you know, the town and buying clothes and trying to get rid of the money. So that was a kind of early experience of entrepreneur, I means bringing together the factors of production to do something. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, this is you know, what you I like doing. That. Did you enjoy yeah. the perks of it or the actual process of it? The, the creative process of yeah. seeing it work, seeing a chemistry lab full of kids, you know, kind of glued to a film and the whir whirring sound of it, just, you know, this thing is working, it, it wasn't working before in the same way, it's, it's, it's an entity now, it's actually something. So it's interesting, Did you, do you think that's your creative juices just working and you find something or is it that you have a problem and you then enjoy trying to solve the problem per se? Um, I, I don't know, I think it's about creating a, um, a little mini world um, of something that didn't exist before and everything that goes into creating that mini world, which is a brand, a culture, you know, a, a kind of outcome you want, um, a, a measure of how, how we're doing a good, good job or not. It's, it's all of that together mm. as an amal amalgamation. So that's your entrepreneurial spirit. I, I remember um, a Crow, I can't remember if it was Durham House, anyway. Yeah. They used to sell uh, toast and stuff on a Sunday morning, so we used to have a line on Sunday morning before church at 10.30. I used to do orders in the night, used to come up with toast and jam and stuff, and 5p for this, 5p that. So there were some industrial yeah. entrepreneurs at school. Yeah. Um, so when you left school, um, did it stop? Did it carry on? Did you go to university? Did you not? What was the sort of the next 
before we get to Hotel Chocolat itself, what were the next stages that sort of you think sort of the building blocks to get to where you are now? Yeah, so I, I went to uh, Sheffield University and did French and economics. Um, a and good entrepreneurial uh, degree, yes. Well, <laughs> I, I thought I've been to boys' school, so I, f I figured I like I love French, and I thought I'd make loads of girls as well, yeah. you know, because you know languages tend to be very female orientated, okay, and then I like economics. Logic, yeah. I was was interested in economics, so um, the uh, the four-year course, year three, had to be spent in France, living in France, and I. By year three, I, did, I didn't want to be, I'd got a bit bored with university and I'd left a, a terrible kind of mess of um, un, unfinished projects and stuff like that. So going to, going to France for a year was like an escape and I persuaded them that I could get a job instead of being attached to another, albeit French university. So I turned up at this uh, little, well, this, this French city, Lille in the north. Yeah. And I'd got a job with a software business, and they'd forgotten I was arriving. So I, I sort of turned up, and and um, they went, "Oh, mad, you know, <laughs> c'est l'anglais, you know, and you know, basically shuffling around. What are we going to do with him? He's here." Um, and none of them spoke any English at all, which is great. So my French just went like that, and they they just explained what they were doing and said, "Look, could you try and export this this thing?" to, you know, UK, um, and I just turned out I could. So after the first year, I was accounted for about 30% of their sales, and they, you know, they kept, you know, my stock in the business was going up like this, you know, they, even the boss would, you know, allow me to call him two, which is quite a big deal. Um, so Vincent, this kind of bonkers French guy, used to drink beer at about 11 o'clock in the morning yeah. and 14 espressos and he used, to, he used to allow me to argue with him as well. Yeah. So um, then at the end of that year they begged me to stay and I never wanted to go back to university knowing what, you know, a, a terrible mess I'd left behind. So I decided to um, drop out of university and, and throw my lot in with, with this business for yeah, another yeah. year. Um, and near the end of that second year, um, I was starting to fall out a bit with the boss, and he, I can remember him shouting at me, saying, you're either going to start your own business or, or end up going to prison, which I thought was a bit harsh. Um, so anyway, so I decided to leave at that point, and, and I found a job in a kind of related field in Cambridge, and the guy that hired me, um, Peter, um, it is now my long-term kind of business partner, and he's a guy that um, I worked with for a year in this, in this Cambridge high-tech business called Torch Computers, um, which is really, you know, a very leading business, but was on the wrong end of technology shifts and ended up selling a lot of its stuff to Steve Jobs and, um, you know, was not really going anywhere. So, so Peter and I decided to flip out of that and do something completely different. And the different thing was uh, what eventually became Hotel Chocolat, but it was the most ridiculously niche idea in the whole world of confectionery you've ever heard of. And it was to make little packs of peppermints with companies' logos around them to try and displace the corporate pen as the key, the key thing. I think at the back of our minds, we always knew it was going to be a, a kind of momentum builder of an idea. It wouldn't, wouldn't be the end game but we just wanted to do something refreshingly simple. Um, having lived through torch computers and things like, you know, we sold a, a big um, software and, and hardware package to, uh, to a customer, and then all the hard drives started packing up because the American supplier of the hard drives had had a problem. We had to recall them all and repay all the money, and it was just like, oh my God, we just want something really simple that we can stand behind. Mm. So that was the motivation to, to do this. Um, that business really worked, um, called the, the Mint Marketing Company, and then it allowed us to generate cash, and we then went into doing chocolates, but in the same way, B2B. Um, some great customers like uh, Aston Martin Cars, Dorchester, Barclays Bank, Panasonic. So were you the start of the chocolate on the pillow? Um, no, we, we didn't actually like that business, unfortunately, because the people that buy that know how much chocolate should cost. 
Right. Uh, so they're food and beverage buyers and they're used to buying, you know, a pint of milk or something. And they say, how much do you want? How much for a little tiny piece of chocolate? And we try to explain sort of like the branding and how it makes the customer feel. And it's like, nah, you know, it's five grams of chocolate. It needs to be 3p. And it's very low margin and a lot of other people fighting over that business. So we never wanted to go there. We preferred Corporate. selling chocolate to Panasonic yeah. and focusing more on what, the, what it can do for you rather than the cost of, you know, the cocoa plus the sugar, you know, times the weight. So what was, so was it a morph then into the sort of hotel chocolate world from that? Yeah. Or was there a certain particular point that you made a pivot, as you say? Well, we realized that the B2B side was always going to be a, a tiny subset of the chocolate world. So by then, I'd got into the stage of designing um, our own recipes. We had no manufacturing of our own, but we would get other people to make the chocolates for us and deliver them in bulk. So I'd got kind of a bit obsessed about, um, you know, about the whole world, and I was you know, doing all that. And there was a yearning building up to to address the consumer facing side to uh, offer our what we thought mm. are, are really good recipes outside the b2b arena and the idea we came up with was to make them into um, fast delivered chocolate gifts that fitted through a letterbox so this was in the um, 1990s and that coincided with a very early um, beginning of, um, of, of the internet and so a bit of a breakthrough is when we were approached by AT&T, mm. a huge American um, tech business, and they said, you know, we're looking for businesses that can prove that the internet can be a commercial forum. Uh, would you be interested in having a thing called a website? And we'll, we, you know, we'll design it for you free of charge and you just pay us 10% of the sales. So, I, you know, I was interested to do it, so we did it. And it showed us what was possible there with the, the idea of, you know, I want to send chocolates to Rory so I can, I can use the phone or I can use online to order and then this, this business is going to get them delivered with a message card, fit through a letterbox and, and, and that, you know, was a bit of a takeoff for us. So we had some great growth from there. Then um, we wanted to, to kind of, uh, we had a great customer base but the only problem was when you think about a gift, so every, you know, say Rory is the guy that I associate with chocolate, then his birthday only happens once a year. It's a long time between a year, and I might forget about her to chocolate in that time. So we wanted to create a business that would have more frequent contact points. So we created a subscription business that had the idea that every month you would receive a different selection of chocolates with tasting notes, always the same price uh, and you would leave it to me to put the selection together and kind of trust me that you'll like most of them. There's bound to be a few you don't like, but you know, it's all experimentation. Yep. Um, so the two things together en enabled us to, to, you know, to really start motoring as a business. Um, and then the, the, the final bit was rebranding the name of the business to Hotel Chocolat. Yeah. Because up to this point, we had more service-based names. So we had a, I'm still slightly ashamed of this name, but Choc Express uh, was our fast delivered chocolate name. We had no marketing budget, so it had to kind of, you know, explain what it did on the tin. And then we had the Chocolate Tasting Club, which again, explained what it said on the tin, but no sense of brand. mystique or yeah, brand yeah. build or anything like that. So I, I was painfully aware that we weren't getting that kind of emotional lift, but mechanically, and from a service point of view and a quality, those businesses were working. So I, my job was to, you know, to think of a, a, a new brand name. And what I analysed was that the big, the big thing that great chocolate can do for humans is to give escapism from every day. You know, you, you put a piece in your mouth and it can just transport you somewhere in your mind. It's a, it, you know, a legal drug in a way. Um, and I it can make that. you, yeah, make you feel amazing, and it can make other people feel amazing. So, it, the promise of escapism. Uh, so from that, I took the word hotel, and then I, from living in France, I'd heard um, French women say chocolat. It's just like, 
in, lodged in my memory forever. Oh, really? There's no better way to describe the melt of chocolate than chocolat. Chocolat, the way Brits say it, is the snap. But nobody's really interested in the snap. We're all interested in the melt. So chocolat was, you know, was there in a hotel. And once, once we had a decent brand, we did really feel like we got the wind in our sails mm -hmm. immediately. I mean, it was just an amazing feeling that I've never experienced my business career before, with a, you know, like an idea or a strategy coming off so well, but going from a, a you know, terrible brand to a, to a potentially strong brand, that feeling of just the winds with you now was, was palpable. Um, so when you think about Hilda Chocolat, I've just said, you know, everywhere you go, there's a shop. But of course, also, you're a film star now, or at least a TV star. I don't know if anybody watched the, the BBC Two programme, if you're interested. Um, you recognise, A, the passion you have in the business, um, to the extent that obviously it's not just a fairly small part of the business, a niche, you have actually vertically done it. So uh, I think people that watch the show will know that you've got this place in St. Lucia. But what was the next stage then? Obviously you create the brand, the, the wind was in your sails, it was starting going off, but you were still, it's, it just seems when I, you know, when I see you on the TV and I, you know, when we meet up or whatever, you have this passion for chocolate, not just being a one-stop one shop to a certain extent. It's, as you say, yeah. a long experience. How did that journey go around what you want to achieve with regards to from plant to... Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's well known I'll do anything to sell a box of chocolate. So, you know, <laughs> being on... I, fortunately, they didn't ask me to take my clothes off for the TV. <laughs> Thank but God I, for I, that. I, I was totally prepared to do anything. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, doing a documentary is a bit of a risk, but I looked at our business culture and, and the risk assessment was, you know, a bit of a no-brainer. I really believe in the culture, believe in the people we've got. And so giving free access to a documentary crew embedded with us for three months, um, showing the, you know, people what we really like inside the business was, um, it was a great opportunity for us. The, um, the vertical integration side really started from um, a, first of all, just an analysis of, okay, we're promising escapism on one level, but our chocolate's got to be, um, it, it's got to be some of the best chocolate in the world. How do, we, how do we make it the best chocolate in the world? And it has to start with the, the, the cocoa bean. So I, I, I've got an old book, which was given to me by one of my customers, actually, she sent it to me in a post and just said, look, you might want to read this book. And it was about chocolate brands 100 years ago, so in the 1920s, and how back then uh, British chocolate brands used to be completely involved with the agriculture. So think Quaker chocolate brands like Fry's, uh, you know, Roundtree's, Cadbury's, all these brands used to be amazing, used to have very, very strong ethical values driven by their Quaker, you know, beliefs. And they really, you know, had a intention to really look after all parts of, of their value chain, including the growers. Obviously it was, you know, a kind of slightly condescending approach because it was a hundred years ago, but nevertheless the intent was, was more positive. So when I read this book, I just realized that in the intervening a hundred years, everything had gone completely backwards and the chocolate brands had deliberately separated themselves from agriculture because it was kind of so embarrassing that you had these growers who were in total poverty and then you had this food stuff that's eaten by rich nations and it's all about happiness and the two worlds couldn't be more opposite. One's got loads of profit and uh, loads of happiness and the other's got negative profit and loads of misery and so this, this sort of, you know, Hessian sack dividing wall was created and, and, you know, the two worlds were disconnected. So I could see a win-win for Hutter Chocolat. First of all, I lived in the Caribbean, cocoa's grown in the Caribbean, and I wanted to buy an old cocoa farm and, and really understand it to, um, to make sure we, we could be the, one of the best chocolate makers in the world. At the same time, we wanted to act as a blueprint to reconnect agriculture and luxury together and act as a kind of pressure, um, pressure group for the rest of the industry to try and um, 
um, increase consumer awareness that this disconnection had happened. So yeah, you know, be a bit mischievous and create a bit of um, spoiler party for these you know big fat chocolate brands who are making you know super profits and paying no tax off the back of poor cocoa farmers in Ghana who just want to raise a family and you know I, I knew there was enough money to go around there's plenty of profit to actually make it right for cocoa farmers so that was the motivation to do that and then around the same time we also got into manufacturing because we realised that a lot of the IP that we developed as um, creative concepts when we got other people to make them for us, sooner or later those ideas kind of seeped out into the wider economy and we realised that as a business one of our biggest assets is, is the brand, the culture, but also the creative IP and the differentiation in our designs, the way, we, the, the way we taste, the way we look, the way we're different to Belgian chocolate or Swiss chocolate or Marks and Spencer chocolate. You know, we had to maintain that point of difference. So it was worth us getting into our own manufacturing and developing our own machinery that would make it difficult for people to copy our techniques and our, and our know-how. Mm. So the two things, I mean, slightly crazily, we started them in the same year, the agriculture and the manufacturing. Right. Um, and is it still all made up of Huntington? Is that the main factory you have? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, 90-odd percent of all our chocolates are made in um, Cambridgeshire and Huntington. Yeah, so we're proper... Um, there is an out British outlet. manufacturer. There's an outlet stall there as well. I know Laura's been there many times, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, you have a, a farm in St Lucia. Yep. You mentioned Ghana. Have you got something in Ghana as well? No, so what we do is we, uh, we grow about 5% of the cocoa that we ever use in, on our own model farm in St Lucia. Right. And that enables us to get the knowledge and, and, the, and also grow some very premium beans that are literally polished by by us all the time and they're, you know, we love those beans. But the, the biggest um, supply base for our beans is Ghana, right. where we've got about 3,000 um, families who own their own small holdings and are growing cocoa for us and supply their cocoa through the Ghana Cocoa Board right. and we then buy it from the Ghana Cocoa Board. Yeah. Um, but you control it to make sure that they get the yes. money to be able to live. And well, it's, yeah, so the, the, the way we work it is that there's um, uh, cocoa in Ghana represents 20% of the economy. So all the cocoa goes through the exchequer. And the government arbitrages between the farm gate price, which is too low, and the selling price um, to the outside world, which is um, lowish, but there's nevertheless a, an arbitrage amount. The, that extra bit pays for schools, roads, etc. So in Ghana, everybody knows that the cocoa growers are, you know, are kind of heroes, you know, and that they. Um, you know, there's a saying, you know, Ghana is cocoa, cocoa is Ghana. It's really, a, you know, a, a symbolically very important. The cocoa growers are being shortchanged, so our solution is to pay directly to the farmers a supplementary amount, uh -huh. which we pay directly into their bank accounts. Um, and our calculation is that is enough to enable them to earn a living income. In addition to that, we have a, a body of knowledge that we've learned from running our own farm about um, what we call gentle farming, how to, how to grow cocoa in a biodiverse way that's gentle on the environment and um, impedes cli uh, climate change by um, a uh, putting shade trees above the uh, cocoa trees are relatively small about this big so the best the best way to grow is having a shade tree over the top and then underplant some uh, market garden um, products underneath the cocoa as well so you end up with this horizontal biodiverse rich environment with loads of insect life and cross pollination it's also quite um, shaded and retains moisture in the soil so you get less erosion from wind and, and, and being baked in the sun um, so it's a win-win for everybody so we um, we basically fund uh, these shade trees to be supplied to our farmers and we we, we sent out 500,000 trees in the last 12 months okay. yeah um, so it's it's a big it's a big financial commitment for her to and we also supplied 
um, some squads of uh, kind of like agricultural rangers who help the farmers to, to prune the trees to allow those uh, shade trees to be planted and then to get them planted in the optimum way so they survive and uh, you know we can pass the, pass the most risky period of going from a monocropped farm to a biodiverse uh, gentle farm. The other thing about cocoa growing as well is that when it's grown in a, um, a, a kind of hard farming way you tend to impoverish the soil over 30 years and so before palm oil growing was vilified the, the previous culprit that kind of has escaped public scrutiny is basically cocoa growing um, and cocoa grows best around the equator where most of the tropical biodiversity also is and the, the textbook way to grow cocoa used to be chop down some rainforest, the soil's really fertile, shove a load of cocoa trees on there, grow it for you know one grower's career for 30 years, when the, when the children are ready chop down some more rainforest, move to that instead and then step and repeat through the generations and that's how deforestation mm -hmm. has really you know got a hold so gentle farming is really important from um, in, in terms of doing the right thing for all of, all of us the planet and then the supplementary amounts mean the farmers can actually raise a family properly. So when you eat that hotel chocolate piece of chocolate just imagine what's going on through all that story. it's incredible um, I've learned stuff from that bit as well I mean it just what I was trying to get through is that you've got this relationship with Ghana uh, farmers you've got this um, hotel if anyone's got a hotel um, there's a hotel in St. Lucia you can go and yep. enjoy. Um, Rabo, I always get the date wrong. Rabo 1604? No. It so, is 16, um, 1745. 1745 yep. in um, Borough Market. Mm -hmm. yep. um, nice restaurant. It has all the difference infusion of the cocoa bean in some way, shape, or form in the food. Highly recommend that. Um, so you've got a restaurant, you've got a hotel, you've got a, uh, you own a, um, a cocoa plantation in St. Lucia. You've got all this relationship with um, farmers in Ghana. Um, you've just talked about the whole context of your way of, um, you know, uh, not raping and pillaging the planet and people, but trying to make sure it's all inclusive and holistic. Um, I mean, how many stores have you got in the UK? Off the top of my head, roughly. Yeah, we've got 130 stores. 130 stores. Yeah. So um, you talk about um, obviously creating a brand, the culture, uh, plantation, all these different things, plus you're saving the planet. Um, What's your role? You're not even a role of CEO of Host of Chocolates. It sounds like you should be in charge of the UN, but you know, what, what do you think about your role? All the different things you talked about, you can tell you, everybody can agree, he's, he's passionate about everything to do with, with uh, cocoa and coffee. What's your, what do you think your role is as a CEO of a company like that, especially with what you just explained, what you're trying to do? Yeah. Um, in answering this, I'm, I'm totally aware that you know, there's different business models yeah. and, and people are operating in different categories or, or, or service businesses. Given the type of business that Hotel Chocolat is, we're, we're really powered by spirit. Um, and if we get the spirit right in the business, the, the collective sense of purpose, um, what, you know, what, why do we get out of bed in the morning? What's our job? Um, then everybody uh, raises their game. Yes, we get better productivity, of course, but also you know, more fulfillment. Um, our customers get better service. We can be more, uh, more on, our, on our game and not kind of just sleepwalk or be processional about our jobs. So my, my, my role is to um, be the, the, the key um, keeper of the brand, um, what the brand stands for, the purpose, the values, to be the one who holds everybody to account on the values, but is also held to account myself. And I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm a values-driven person, but I'm also very commercial. So sometimes, and I'm human, so particularly when the business is under pressure, I've been tempted to look at a Weasley way out sometimes. Um, and when you've got people around you that you just take one look at them and you just know I'm not even going to mention it because, you know, I'm going to get a shot down in flames and they won't, you know, the culture that I've created will not allow me to even indulge a conversation about that Weasley way out. We've got to take the high road. Then you know that actually 
you've, you know, the, the, the brand has wings, it is properly, it's properly living, breathing a strong culture. That makes me very really proud. It's terribly inconvenient sometimes because it means you have to take some things off the table, but everything in life comes with compromise. You know, it's like, it's like keeping a successful marriage together. You know, certain things are off the table, um, but, you know, for everything's the sweeter for the sacrifice and everything that's strong and true has to have sacrifice behind it. So, um, yeah, my, my, my job is to um, be, be the leader of the business in terms of values, um, in terms of strategy, and in terms of purpose. So I'm probably more like an amalgamation of um, chairman and, and CEO, and that means there's space beneath me for more empowered executives who are um, CEOs of different elements within Hertha Chocolat, and that's the way we've structured the business. So I have a, a, a kind of retailing-led CEO, uh, Lisa, who's um, our key kind of um, marketeer and commercial expert. And then I've got Matt Margerison, who's our uh, manufacturing and distribution um, expert. Um, and and those, those are my two key key mm. people that represent the two elements of, of the business. We've got a, a CEO in St. Lucia as well, who is um, a, 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 you know, agricultural and agricultural um, agro-tourism um, operator. So we, we run a hotel, we have a visitor attraction, and he's, he's also a farmer. So finding somebody to do that job is, is always pretty interesting, but yeah. So the success you've seen, you've 100 odd places and all these sorts of things, we see success, success. But one assumes that this journey you've had when you started, there must have been some ups and downs along the way. And of course, we know what's happened the last two, three years. So what have been some of your uh, memories about some of those ups and downs? And what have you learned from that as you as a, as a leader, as well as yep. your, your, your company? Yeah, um, I mean, the last, I think, same for everybody, maybe the last kind of three years have been sort of totally bonkers. Um, we, we had a, a, a really big existential threat to the business when the first wave of COVID um, came into the UK and the prospect of lockdown started being in the air. We were literally poised to trade Easter. And if you think about retailing businesses in the UK, there's not very many of them that are very dependent on Easter eggs, apart from probably us. So um, we, we had about um, two or three weeks to go before Easter and we had all our Easter eggs out in all our stores and you know, poised ready. And then we had to start closing the stores with all the stock in. So I realized that we were not gonna get bailed out by the government or anything. Everything was moving too fast. They had bigger fish to fry, obviously. And we were gonna have to look after ourselves to survive. So we, our teams, uh, with, you know, did a kind of chocolate Dunkirk um, thing of getting, getting all that, those Easter eggs repatriated back to our main distribution center. Everybody repackaged them and, and you know, people drove them back and all sorts of stuff. So we got the majority of Easter eggs back to our online distribution center and we were able to continue trading online. And our online business you know, kind of tripled. Um, and we managed to uh, do a, a competent kind of Easter campaign which meant the business you know, survived beyond that. So that was like a, a total test of our collective willpower, our ingenuity, um, and it came out of nowhere and happened so blisteringly quick. It was like you know, almost being run over by a truck or something. You know, it's just like you don't see it, and then suddenly this thing barreling towards you. So I was immensely proud of our culture and our achievement in doing that. Um, so that's one of, one, of, one of the things that is just, you know, like here of what could have happened and what did happen. Um, then we, we had a, uh, a few years of, you know, three years of very, very strong growth and last year about 40% growth. And that created some of the growing pains that you identified in your um, analysis there, Rory. So we, we, we realized that we probably grew too quickly and it drags up too much complexity for us and we weren't able operationally to handle it. So now I'm calming the business down this year and saying, right, we're gonna go for a, a staging 
post Something where we're going to yeah. calm everything down, take a bit of a breath, a bit like you when you do one of your big try scoring sprints. <laughs> you know, recover. basically, you can yeah. do a burst for a bit, yeah. forty percent growth, but then you need a bit of rest, yeah, don't yeah, you? Yeah. And then you can, you know, rack yeah. up another one. Um, so same, same for a business. So we, we, we pretty much found the same thing that we, you know, forty percent is too fast for us to hold together and achieve a quality execution. Um, so I'm, I'm hacking my way through that at the moment, and it's, you know, I, I regret that I. I, I allowed the business to grow so quickly. It was my, my ambition for the brand, my um, risk appetite. So I've still got a lot of risk appetite. And I think in, in, in our business, we recognize that we have optimism bias. And I don't think it's a bad thing, but I think knowing what type of animal you are is really important to put in place um, corrective measures if you find that you know you need to double down on governance or risk scenario measuring or things like that so so certainly we kind of barreled into it with lots of bravado and um, now I'm, I'm you know got this slightly painful thing of, of hacking our team down a little bit and um, turning off some cherished projects that I started which um, given the state of the consumer economy now it's just not the right time for me to be doing that. So I have to take my own medicine and say, you know, yes, that was my baby, but it's going on a subs bench and it's going to have to wait its turn until we're operationally ready uh, to have an appetite to, to do a proper job on it. One thing that comes out is you talk about spirit and, yeah. and the way you run the business and also what comes out very much is the, the culture of business, especially, you know, you talked about uh, how do I get a million eggs back to the distribution? And of course, everybody just hands the pump, which is fantastic to see. So culture is obviously a very big part of uh, Hotel Chocolat, and you see that in the brand very clearly. Um, but I'm used to find out as well, because there's the culture of the brand and whatever, and also you've got this very strong culture in the business. But not only have you got 100 odd stores here, but you've also tried to expand internationally into the States and in Japan. Now, obviously, anybody who's worked in the States will wonder what the culture is like over there. Uh, etc. So what were some of the challenges you had? You know, you've got your health au chocolat culture. How did you try and merge, differentiate it? You know, what were the challenges with regard to that when you were trying to move into the States and into Japan? Yeah, I mean, it, it starts with um, setting out, well, first of all, hiring the right people. Yeah. You know, you've got to, first, in, in our case, we put a great store on, um, you know, kind of people with Good motivations, who are who are you know kind, who are who are kind of brave, who are values driven, obviously high work ethic and highly intelligent, but just you know really good people. So we don't like people with um, you know with a nasty edge. They might be high high performance business operators, mm. but we we just don't like to have those people in the business. So that's the starter. And then very be very being very clear about what the um, the purpose and mission of Hotel Chocolat is to make people happy through chocolate. Um, and then the values that drive that are to be original, which means don't copy other people and celebrate creativity, to be authentic, which means to be the real deal, more cocoa and less sugar, to stand up for the business and, and, and stand up for our commitments to our customers, you know, to be the real deal, to be authentic, and then to be ethical. So where we have influence and resources to try, to try and make positive things happen in, in every field that we're involved with. Um, and that's a difficult one to police because if it's allowed to run amok too much, it makes our procurement team too soft, for example. And it's like, no, 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 you're still supposed to get the best deal in town, but just do it ethically. Well, what does ethically mean? Well, it means, you know, if there's an incumbent supplier, you don't just chop them off at the knees. You allow them to enter a competitive process to see if they want to, you know, still work with us for the next three years. You know, just being playing with a straight bat. That's what, you know, at one level, super, you know, maybe a bit superficially, but that's what ethical means in that arena. And making sure that those suppliers have um, proper audited supply chains and, and holding people to, uh, you know, packaging, sourcing, and, and, and obviously all the texture around that as well. 
So, yeah, th th those, those three values, to be original, to be authentic and to be ethical, are what powers the business ahead. And, and that has proven to be kind of enough to um, fill the business with you know, good people and to give them a, a, a framework and, a, and a, um, a, north, a series of North Stars, yeah. if you like, to follow without complicating it and trying to keep it really simple. I remember some of our conversations um, around some of the challenges you had, especially in Japan, was the heat was a problem, was it, and stuff like that? And so it's not only just the culture and trying to get the right people, but also you've got technical, logistical issues with, mm. with moving out there. Some of those challenges you had with those, I remember, quite interesting. Oh, God, I mean, the, the list of... To, to become an international brand is, is um, a, big, a big ambition for, for us. And I think probably in retrospect, we underestimated how much... Um, you know, kind of love and tinkering went into getting the UK model to work in the way it does. And, and so taking, taking that and transplanting it to another country, it turns out to be a lot harder than we expected. So we, we know that the brand works in other countries. You know, we've tried it out in, 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 in quite a few territories. So people, people in other countries get the brand, what it stands for. They like the taste of our chocolate. And what we haven't got right yet is the operating model to connect the brand and the products with those populations in the smartest way for the different markets. Um, and we've tried and we are trying um, various ways and we'll keep trying until we unlock the optimum way. Uh, and that ranges from straightforward wholesaling through to online only, through to uh, multi-channel retailing, joint ventures, company owned, you know, there's, there's a number of permutations about how to actually create that operating model and perfect it. Um, so that's, you know, a big, a big body of work for the senior team in Hotel Chocolat at the moment to cross the Rubicon and become a, you know, a, a proper thriving international brand. The UK's doing great for us and we're not complacent about that and we've got loads of headroom, but I don't want to leave it too late to um, keep trying on international and, and, and you know and get that to you know to really work. So, work in progress. yeah, still work in progress very much. Um, I mean, I've learned a lot today. You know, and we've known each other for so many years. But uh, some of the challenges you face and everything else. And so, just finishing off now before we go to a Q and A, uh, I left you a couple of questions. I don't really remember what they were. So, there's two questions I'll ask you. First one is, um, if you're going to go back to your 18 year old self or your 20 year old self when you were uh, that, that middle year in university and give yourself a piece of advice to the young Angus Thurwell, what would it be? I think, um, I, I know I was um, a bit arrogant when I was, um, I wasn't that arrogant when I was at school, but when mm. I had some early success when I was in France, I, I definitely know it went to my head a bit. And uh, although that was there. I don't think innately I had a lot of confidence in my, 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 my skills. I hadn't identified what I'm good at yep. uh, in a clear enough way. And so I, I'd, and now I'm, you know, I know what I'm good at and I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a very effective at what I'm good at, but also very clear what, what I'm not so good at. And I wish I'd known that a bit more mm. clearly when I was, when I was younger, bo in both ways, to amp, to amp up the good stuff and be aware of where the gaps are and what type of people I need to work with and making sure that I held out to get the very highest caliber of people to, um, to, you know, to balance the, the skills that I bring. And so more of a piece of advice for anybody here. So you've grown a company from an idea, well, two ideas to create Hotel Chocolat. You've grown the brand to being, I don't know what, you must have over hundreds of employees, if not more, um, stores all over the place. Um, so you've been through the challenges of growing a, a brand, trying to create an international brand. You have, but it's, you, know, you want to be even more successful. So what, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give to anybody here who's going through some of the same challenges that they could hear you, that you would offer them in the context of how you grow, how you get, overcome all the challenges, and how do you try and create a successful brand? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it always starts with values and purpose. You know, it, I don't think it can start anywhere else, and, and people. So if you've got 
those three things, and you're in a room together, and you're talking about, okay, wh why, what are we trying to do here? What do we stand for? And do we like each other? Okay, that, that's a great start. Then, obviously, going into strategy and accepting that strategy should adapt and not, not being ashamed of that, uh, ripping bits up and starting again. I think, I think the bravery of pivoting and changing at the right time is, is something that's underestimated in business. Um, and it's perfectly all right to change your mind when new data becomes available. And, and that's, that's you know, keeping that curiosity burning bright of, I want to know more about how our customers perceive the brand. I want to know more about this. I want to know more about that. And not taking a fixed assumption set and assuming that it's right or assuming that it doesn't evolve over time, mm. I think is key. So um, some things are, should be strong frameworks that never change, purpose and values, and the, the people you're going to be long-term collaborators with. But then the rest of it, I think, can, can adapt and should be quite dynamic. Mm. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you very much, Angus. So I throw open to the floor. Has anybody got any questions uh, for Angus here? You can ask him whatever you like. What do you like at school or anything like that? Yes. Hi, Angus. Hi. Yeah, that was really interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, how have you seen the business change uh, over the course of the pandemic and out, out, hopefully out the back end of it, regarding your sales and your mixture of sales between uh, the high street and, and e-commerce? And um, have you changed your the way that you go about business because of the pandemic? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, um, <clears throat> we, uh, we're probably a bit unusual because um, it, you, the, the ratio between on, you know, if you call it online as a proxy for delivered, including telephone and, you know, other, and, and then physical retailing where you get instant gratification of, I want those chocolates, I'm going to carry them home under my arm. So delivered mostly online and, and, and um, take home. Our model used to be 100% delivered before we had any stores. Then we had a, um, through the, the, the 2000 years, we had a, a, you know, a big rollout of stores because they, they really worked for us in terms of new customer acquisition, building the brand, um, and, and, and creating a, a, a space that we could, um, if you like, seduce our customers through inviting them into our area and, and give people a taste of chocolate and, and, a, and a conversation much more powerful than online can for our particular type of product. So gradually we saw the proportion of online actually drop and drop and drop and drop until we got to a pretty stable 20%. And that level seemed to be the level it was going to kind of stay at. We were growing in both areas. And then when the pandemic hit, we, we temporarily had a crazy situation where um, online had increased by 350% and physical stores were zero for a while. And then stores opened again. And what we found um, was that the, the customers who were buying online from us had different emotional drivers or um, solutions they were looking for than physical store buyers. So the, the two circles overlap, but they're not completely on top of each other. So unlike some re retailers, we didn't see a, a mass herd movement back to stores and online completely you know, dropped back to what it was again. So we, we're, we are seeing now a bit more rebalancing, but the, the shape we're going to end up with is um, probably 40% online as, a, as a, you know, a kind of permanent structural shift uh, with a business that's doubled, um, doubled in size over the, the, the last three years. And then physical stores are, 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 the, are the rest and, and, and working really well for us. So, so do you think you've got a better business out of the pandemic? Or a better mixture of business out of the pandemic? I mean, yeah. I mean, we, once, once I've finished um, dealing with our growing pains and our imperfect execution in some aspects of dealing with that ferocious growth that we weren't used to, um, yes, I mean, definitely we... Have in terms of our competitive set um, in the UK, we, we've advanced our cause by probably 10 years. So it's come with a lot of, a lot of pain and a lot of 
temporary, you know, kind of body blows. But actually, when you look at the long game, which is, you know, all I'm interested in, then yes, the, the, you know, we were able to adapt and 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 and, and you know, ride with the, the you know the dramatic sociological, economic changes that were afoot and adapt quite quickly. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go as far as to say the pandemic was positive because obviously there's so much you know, human misery and uh, I'm not sure when, you know, if you put it all in the balance if that is the case or not. But in any, in any crisis, there's opportunity and can, can, can businesses take advantage of crises which can be of any type. And I think that's one of the tests of culture. It, you know, is, is, your, is your business alert enough, commercially aware enough, um, to be able to take advantage of things that unexpectedly open up, which can give you a accelerated Darwinism um, effect. It's more risk, more, more pain, more chaos, but you either hide under a rock while it's all happening, or you decide to, to kind of get out there in a storm and try and plot your, your way, which, you know, is, there's only one way that the Hutter Chocolat culture would kind of want to go, and, and that's the one we took. So, very pressing question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Gordon. Yeah, Gordon. Uh, Angus, when, when you talk about um, purpose and values and these sorts of things, um, how, does, how does that sit with any of the money men that you've had to deal with over the years, venture capitalists or that sort of men in grey suits and sort of stuff, which I'm sure you've had to yeah. with their world. I know. Um, to begin with, I was very wary of it. I, I thought that if we'd had um, a PE fund, for example, funding her to Chocolat, and I said I wanted to buy a cocoa farm, they would have vetoed it. And that's probably correct, because the, the business model was more about brand value and knowledge rather than the economics of how much money you can make out of farming. Um, so once we got to a point where I felt like we'd done all the crazy stuff and we had a brand that um, had some kind of tangible, tangible value and values, then when we decided to do an IPO, I, I, I wanted to emphasize, overemphasize that we're not a traditional chocolate business. We, we have an adventurous culture. We've got a, a mandate of, of you know, driving ethics. And yeah, profit's important to us, but it's not the only thing. The most important things are these, these, and these. And it actually resonated surprisingly well with that audience. And I, I think at, at the root of it is the, the fact that most of our market value is in the brand. And they recognize that the brand to have value needs to be opinionated and needs to stick to values which are sometimes expensive, short-term, unprofitable, and um, you know, can, be, can be painful. But it's the only way to achieve a personality set, and, and that's what a strong brand has to have. So they, um, they're very enthusiastic about the ethical projects. And I've never once been taken to task by by them saying, why don't you just slash and burn everything, stop paying three million quid to Ghana farmers more than you need to, you know, enough inflation around without you doing your own. Um, nobody's ever said that to me, inside the business or outside the business. Um, is, some so, of that, is that some of that down to, because with an IPO, you obviously have certain, they do, but you can sort of drive who you want to choose as some of your investors in the business. Mm. To a certain extent, n n not really. At the end of the day, it's a market. So yeah. even if they come in on day one, they can sell on day two to, you know, True. the sharkiest investor in the world. Yeah. Um, so it, it, you tend to get the, the investors you deserve over time, mm. um, and um, and that's really what I've seen. So I've I've actually enjoyed the interactions uh, with um, with with kind of analysts and and external yeah. investors, and. It ultimately, it comes down to, to money, of course. Brand value is where the money is. That gives us pricing power, gives us a potential to make sustainable profit. Um, and the brand needs investing in, which they seem to totally accept. Thank you. Interesting. Yes? Yeah, 
Uh, thank you, Angus. Uh, yeah, amazing story. Uh, just just going to go, you know, we've all got stories of successes and failures, but, uh, you know, back to Rory's point about the, the, do you think you invested more than 10% in training? You know, now with some of the complexities you're having, maybe you have to right size your business, maybe you've got the wrong fit with people. That was something I definitely thought I would need one more percent uh, in training. So I, I, just from your experience. I think, um, I think the definition of trainings, uh, you know, Rory mentioned the university of osmosis, and, and so I think it has to be included in training um, in, in the broader sense. Um, so nowhere near 90% at Hota Shokla. So we're, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's a very illuminating contrast when you look at those high performance organizations. Rory's been part of that 90-10. Um, and, I, and I think during the pandemic, we've slid even further back, if I'm really honest, because um, we had to hire people without a proper remote induction program. The induction program relied on physical attendance. We weren't able to adapt it quickly enough. So we, we took on cohorts of new people, all working from home, all of them with impaired induction. And you know, now we've got to catch up double quick to bring those people into the fold, make sure that they're properly inducted. They, they really are, you know, you know, heart and mind, part of the brand, part of the culture. So I'm painfully aware that's slightly unfinished business. Um, and then that's just getting back to the starting line that we're at before. <laughs> and then beyond that, Rory's now set a very high bar. Which, Can I just uh, point out that I'm not saying that you all do 90% training. It's just the expectations that people have if they yeah, want to yeah. be world class. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, tr training. I think I think the, the the risk of empowering people on a overly simplistic training mission is the UK service economy is very skillful in um, lots of um, trainers popping up who do different slices, and it, it's it's. Um, there's certainly a place in the economy for uh, businesses like Wingman who do something very specialist that businesses can't typically do themselves. But it's also, there's a lot of other businesses who are very willing to take um, budget and absolve managers from doing the training that they should be doing as part of their leadership role. And I, I see a lot of kind of leadership cowardice it's probably a slightly tough word, um, at play where it's convenient to subcontract some of the painful stuff to an HR department. If you've got a painful conversation, it's, you know, I don't do that, the HR department can sort it out. Or a training need, I'll just, you know, buy somebody in. And actually, it's about rolling in, you know, depending on what sort of business you are. I, I like a business where the leaders um, put their arms around their team and, they, and, and they're working together to make, you know, to help the training come up, and then on top of that, identifying selective areas that um, are worthy of investment over and above that. If you can find the right managers like that, it's brilliant. Yeah. But as I say, a lot of companies haven't got that skill set, so they don't know how to train people. They know how to performance manage because they it's all the numbers. Yeah. But they don't know how to develop manage. So it's a development coaching as opposed to thing. Uh, just John, do you want to ask us? I'll come yeah. back to you, sit and. Peter, a minute. Sorry, John. I just wanted to ask a question to you, Rory. In terms of when you're going into these businesses with fresh sets of eyes, yeah. what's the thing that you see again and again that people just can't see the wood for the trees and there's a problem in that? And whatever Rory says, and you say it's a problem in Hotel Shop Club. Um, <laughs> crikey, there's so many different things. The first thing is yeah. that um, when a, a leader, a boss, or MD or CEO espouses that I've communicated the strategy, the fact is, when you go and speak to people in the business, they've heard it and seen it, but they don't know what it means to them. So for people, they don't understand what I have to do, what I have to do with my team, and what I've got to do with other team to deliver. Hence, go back to that first question about, is your business delivering its full potential and ability against the strategy? Mm. So the first thing is that if you don't get that, and of course it boils down to mm. the whole purpose, and mm. part of that is values in there, and people massively. Um, around it and so the two main areas that I find is that therefore that is not disseminated down through the uh, organization as effectively as it can be because I go back to the skill mm. set of managers and leaders and various people and they don't understand what it means 
and it's just like, oh, that's your number, just deliver that. And it, it just sort of exacerbates that whole walled scenario. And then secondly, because of all that um, siloed or walled thinking, cross-functional relationships in virtually every business I go into is nowhere near as it could, as it could be. People just don't know how to work with other parts of the business. They sort of know how to work with that part of the business, which is before what I do, and that part of the business after. But it's not as good as it could be. But any other part of the business? No. So it stifles innovation, it stifles collaboration, it stifles in, in a synergy. And so uh, part of what I'm trying to create here is the whole concept of it's not just creating lift for sake, lift sake. It's if you did this, so the, the question I tend to ask is how do you know that the success of your teams is because of them working as teams or in spite of them working as teams? And I haven't had a single leader who can answer me that question because people don't measure it. It's, it's a feeling or a sense. Yeah. And so the problem you've got is, if you're achieving X and you've got this much drag, either you can go, let's make a few changes and we still achieve X, but we have an easier life, or you achieve Y doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and in Huda Shokla's case, one of the analyses we've made is um, if you imagine a manufacturing business as a circle and a retailing business, we, we've had a, a quite a deep overlap on those two businesses. And the areas that overlap um, are very prone to complexity. And they're relatively easy to manage when senior people have, have got their arms over everything. As soon as it start, you start trying to write process for something that is complex like that, we found that it's creating, it has created a lot of drag for us. So we're, um, we've now separated those two businesses to have the minimal overlap, and we've got a, a, a standard sales and operating uh, monthly process that we've kicked off, where every month we've got a group of cross-functional people who are looking at um, what is it we're trying to sell, what's the product portfolio, what's coming in, what's going out, and then how much of it should we make? So that's another slightly different group who are looking at manufacturing capacity, um, risk appetite for stock, working all that out. And then um, we, we have a, a, a third group of, are we going to make any money out of it? So they're looking at, okay, you've got a new project. Uh, does it meet the hurdle rate? Uh, no, okay, how long are we going to try it before we decide that it's either, you know, kill or, 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 or continue. Putting all those things in place will give us the opportunity to have that cross-functional, non-silo working. But we, we've previously relied on that kind of happening through natural fermentation in a business, through people you know, wanting to do the right thing, organizing themselves. But I've had to realize that that's we're, you know, we're, we employ 2,500 people now. So it stopped working in the way that it used to. And so we're going to have to, if you like, going from being a natural winemaker where the grapes ferment with whatever yeast is in the air, that used to be our old way, to being a, a disciplined winemaker where you have your own yeast and you put it into a sealed stainless steel tank on top of the grapes. And that is your method that's your completely controlled process that everybody has to adopt. So it means we're gonna be a slightly different type of business. I'm hoping that it's not gonna in any way squeeze out the, the best bits, but we, we, we definitely recognize that we need a, a, a stronger framework to enable that cross-functional working to actually happen every single month. Um, and Ask me again next year if it's one analogy into chocolate. There you yeah. go. You never heard it here. Peter, and I'll come back to see you in a minute. Well, so, Peter. Firstly, as an entrepreneur, excellent presentation. A lot of the points ring really, Thank really you. close. Um, we, we, you mentioned um, measurement using uh, metrics of cash. Do you have any other metrics to measure your performance uh, and the value that you deliver apart from just straight cash? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're particularly obsessed about. Um, customer database, how many, how many customers have we got, um, and then what is the um, recency of purchase, 
So, you know, are people going off us, still liking us? Um, and then lifetime value. So one of our um, key consumer strategies is revolves around the family. And we, we measure uh, different um, cohorts of customers to see how many of the seven different ways Huda Chocolat can be of service to a family are being taken up. So we, we, we know that um, our, our, our brands and our subject matter can appeal to children, the parents and grandchildren and, and grandparents. And, and so um, developing that cross-generational um, potential is, 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 is probably our key measure at the moment as a direct consumer business. How do you link that with the way your 2,500 people work and how they work effectively together? That's a very simple but difficult question. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, it, it all comes back to making people happy through chocolate. So everybody... Do so you I mean, pay great, people chocolate and in work? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the big analogy is the, you know, which everybody knows, is the, you know, the cleaner helping put somebody on the moon yeah. at NASA. So, we, you know, we're, we know that in order to get cut through with a talismanic message, it needs to be super simple and it needs to be ambitious. So our job is to make people happy through chocolate. The, um, the lady um, that I had a chat with yesterday at our main distribution centre who's packing online orders and, and putting the address label on um, always thinks about her mother when she's seeing the, the selections going into the box. She's always thinking about a family getting, getting this and, you know, and it, it brings home to her memories of sending stuff to her mother. Mm. So she's really fulfilled being the agent of actual happiness there. She's got this stock. She's got a family that expecting it and she's enabling that. So she's playing a really important role just as the person putting the hazelnut on top of the chocolate is or, or the person in our retail store, or, you know, replenishing product on the shelf. So everybody's playing, playing their part and it all um, rolls up to our mission is to make people happy through chocolate, including cocoa farmers. Make me happy, cracky. Uh, thanks, Peter. Sid, you got a question? Um, you are through your purpose and values very much the, the architect of the brand, the holder of the brand, and as you say, as a leader, you demonstrate the brand. Obviously, with a large number of people underneath the culture that's going on in the organisation, as you've gone through that journey, how have you sort of assessed whether the culture is staying aligned to your Brand that you're owning, you're portraying. Yeah. And how have you tested that? And then where have there been times when you feel it's getting sort of out of touch? And then what have you actually done about it? Yeah. Um, I think I think we have to accept that culture is a very fragile, fragile thing, incredibly fragile. Um, and yes, completely. Um, accept that from time to time our culture slightly um, gets influenced by things that I've inadvertently done or um, things the business is doing or popular culture or people coming in from other big businesses with their own ideas. You know, there's literally, it's almost like the barbarians at the gate, isn't it? You've got your precious culture and the, you know, all these influences coming in that are probably well-meaning, but are actually potentially sapping away on, on, on what the culture really is. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in a phase at the moment where I think, for example, our culture has uh, been, been a bit diluted during the, the, the pandemic because of various things. So I'm on a bit of a mission to bring back particularly the um, spirit of commerciality into our culture and the one of the problems of being in institutionally helped through the pandemic as a population is that a lot of people you know and probably all of us have a little bit of expectation that the organization or the government is going to 
you know, do stuff for me. And it sapped away some of the empowerment, the self-help, the commercial awareness, the drive. And I, I want to get that back in, in Hoda Chocolat. So I, I need to explain to people how ethicality and commerciality actually totally do coexist. And sustainable programs need to be profitable for them to exist in the long term. If there's no payback from sustainable programs, they'll fizzle out at some point. When I retire in our case, or um, you know, when a business hits a tough patch, or, or whatever, there's a million reasons why if sustainability isn't embedded in, in a flywheel of actually being more prosperous or better in some way, that it doesn't work. So yeah, it's, it, it's probably the thing I think about most, and sounds like you do as well. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, if nobody's got any last questions, I'm going to wrap it up there because I think it's gone a bit longer than we were expecting to. Um, so, uh, Angus, thank you. Thank really, you for inviting really me. I really appreciate yeah, it. No, so, thank, thank you. you.